Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor, and Pastor Charles Roberts. Thanks for joining us again for another episode of the Out of the Question podcast. Now, today's question is, is it godly to anticipate doom. And Charles, before I turn it over to you, I thought I would go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary and look at what our friend Noah Webster had to say about the word doom. Okay. And as a na- first of all, you can use doom as a verb, but let's, since per my question, doom is being used as a noun, it means judgment, Uh, a judicial sentence, condemnation, and ruin or destruction. So, based on those definitions, is it godly to anticipate doom? Well, um, that depends, Andrea. (laughs) Let me share with you a reading from Jeremiah 17, verse 27. Uh, The Lord says, If you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. So I guess um, the proper answer to that question is, if you are in rebellion against God's law, then at some point you probably should anticipate consequences. I've been teaching and preaching through the book of Exodus, and in Exodus 34, we've come to the part where the Lord reestablishes the covenant with Israel through Moses, and he warns them yet again, you know, don't make any images, don't do this, and don't do these things, and it's a reminder in the original giving of the law that there is an equal ultimacy in God's wrath and his blessing, and so the blessing of the Lord extends to thousands of generations, but so do the consequences, the cascading consequences of disobedience to his law. So I think people who either knowingly or unknowingly at war with God, then sooner or later they will find doom in their future. However, we are talking about those in God's covenant family, and the promises to us are bright and hopeful, regardless of what we see on the local or national news media. All right. So let me take something you just said there. You said people knowingly or unknowingly at war with God. It's not hard to understand that there are people who know what God says and they say, we're going to do the opposite. But what, how would you describe someone who is unknowingly at war with God? I mean, you would think you would know if you were at war with someone. I think the Apostle Paul has largely done that. It makes it easy for me to answer your question. (laughs) Uh, In Romans chapter 1, he refers to those who suppress or hold back the truth and unrighteousness. But he says very tellingly that the existence of God, the obvious presence of the Lord, is plain to them, but they hold down that truth. And he even uses this rather interesting phrase, uh, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So, This is the internal struggle that every human being has to come to terms with, and this is what really lies at the heart of all dis-ease and mental and emotional problems is that at our heart, we have a bad record, and we are born with that bad record, and except for the electing, predestinating love and redemption of the Lord, this characterizes everything that we do, and so this is why people who come to realize that, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm at war with God. What can I do about it? You can see this in Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Men and brothers, what shall we do? Repent and believe on Christ and be baptized, every one of you, for your salvation, you and your, to, your, to your children. I mean, I'm paraphrasing that. Sure, sure. Okay, but this is where I'm getting with okay. my question or going with my question, and that is there are many people who will profess Jesus There'll be many people who will claim that they are part of God's covenant, they are part of God's elect, depending on their theological orientation, they'll use different words. But I'm not sure 
people know how to pull out the measuring stick to say, are my actions, are my attitudes, are my choices things that reflect being in alliance with God as opposed to being at war with God? So let's say we're talking to people here, which I'm guessing we are, who want to obey God and maybe never considered his law as the way in which to measure how they're doing. What are some examples you see at being at war with God that many professing believers might not consider in that vein? Well, there are more than a few examples like that, but let's, uh, let's take perhaps one that is ready to hand and very obvious, and it, it's never far from us, and that's the political realm. You know, we, we have been, we've been taught by broad evangelicalism in our churches that what God is most concerned about is the salvation of your personal soul so that when you die, you go to heaven. I heard a sermon not too long ago in which the one preaching referred continually to the blessed hope of the church, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said nothing about what was supposed to take place in the interim. And this goes at the heart of what you're talking about is that Christians have an idea that all of God's, well, they have this idea, as someone once said, uh, the Old Older Testament is the word of God emeritus. It really doesn't matter to us that much. I mean, after all, there are no red letters in it, right? Right. So uh, it's really up to us or the public schools or our favorite conservative TV or radio talk show host to tell us how to vote, how to live, what we should think about this issue or that issue. So if they have no exposure to godly teaching that points out the fact that it's really impossible to be favorably in God's covenant family and continually be disobeying his law. That calls into question whether or not you're truly in it. And at the end of the day, person, I don't think, and I'm certainly open to correction for this, can go to the Lord and say, well, I'm sorry, I really didn't know that your Ten Commandments applied to me, but I love Jesus. <laughs> right. The reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is that there seems to be I think maybe more than two camps, but let's say two camps. They're the camps that say, you know what? Let's be optimistic. Let's say this is all for the best, not necessarily in any biblical sense, but you know, how bad can things get? And so people just figure they're going to coast along until the tyrant becomes friendly. And then there are others, and we know that this is a certain viewpoint within a lot of the church that says, don't worry, Christ is imminently going to return, and we won't have to deal with this. Praise God for that. Now, both of those things eliminate God's law as it applies to individuals, as it applies to families, as it applies to communities and civil government. And so it seems to me that the real enemy probably shouldn't be too worried if that's the prevailing two opinions that are circulating around, primarily, I think, because as we've thrown out the first two-thirds of the Bible, we've thrown out a lot of history that will tell us what we're experiencing now isn't all that new. And I think this is some of the, uh, these are some of the unpaid bills of people who consider themselves Protestant and Reformed, is that we lay claim to the doctrine of by scripture alone, and then of course by faith alone, but the scripture alone part, I'm not sure they really understand what that means. If, we, if it really means scripture alone, and okay, we can say the caveat properly understood, properly uh, interpreted in its context, etc., but it really means scripture alone, that it is a total word. And so this is why going back again to the book of Exodus, the Lord warned the Israelites you must not worship other gods. And it's interesting in this Exodus 34 passage, he makes the point, you shall not worship metal or molten gods. And in the Exodus 20 verse 4, giving of the law, he says, you shall not have any carved images. Well, I think that was something of an anticipatory thing on God's part, because he knew there would come a day when the Pharisees, among others, would say, well, now, wait a minute. He said carved images, that's wooden. So maybe we can do molten ones that are their metal. Maybe that's a loophole. 
you know. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much reading in the New Testament where you will find those red letters if you have one of those kind of Bibles where Jesus says, and I'm going to, my friend Joe Moorcraft has done this on occasion. I have always appreciated the way he does it. I'm going to do it here. I'm going to intentionally misread what Jesus says here. Mm -hmm. If you love me, this is John 14, 15. If you love me, then have love in your heart. Uh, that's not what he said. If, if you love me, then be kind to each other. That's not what he said. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the defining characteristic of a follower of Jesus. You obey his commandments. And there's nothing in his commandments that says his commandments are only the things that are in the red letters in your New Testament. Sure, because if you say that, then you deny the presence of the second person of the Trinity from Genesis 1.1 who is the word that put everything into being. So it's interesting because if we look at that commandment that you referenced, the second commandment, they're blessings to thousands of generations, not because they have a good hair color or skin color or anything else, who love me and keep my commandments. And so it's very hard to get away from God's commandments, except my experience with people is they'll go, yeah, okay, so I haven't murdered anybody, and you know, and I, I, I don't steal, I don't think, and give me some examples, if you will, of the blindness that people might have that would tell them they're good with God. Well, I think you just hinted at some of them. Okay, I, I haven't killed anybody, so you know, God must think pretty good of me. But we as Christians are at a disadvantage in that we've not been properly taught in our churches to understand, number one, the applicability of a commandment such as you shall not kill, but also its expansion and application. And this is where something like in my tradition and the Presbyterian and Reformed tradition, the Westminster Shorter and Larger Catechisms help us understand these things. And when you do, and of course, the, the prime example is Jesus himself saying, you know, maybe, and I'm paraphrasing here, maybe you haven't picked up a gun and killed anybody, but when you flame throw someone with hateful words, that's essentially at its heart, at the root, the same thing. And it's the same thing with things like lust and adultery. If people would be honest with God and with themselves, they would have to admit they have violated these commandments. I remember reading somewhere, I believe it, it was Henry David Thoreau, wrote Walden Pond. Somebody asked him on his deathbed, you know, have you made your peace with God? And he supposedly said, well, I wasn't aware that we were ever at war with each other. But again, this is a denial of the basic teachings of Scripture that you are born in an attitude of animosity towards God and his law. Okay, um, I've never had an abortion, a woman might say. That's another way of saying I've never killed anybody. But again, we go back to the heart of the matter about what, it, what is the, the letter and the application in the heart of the law. How are we supposed to live? By what standard are we to govern ourselves? Does the, does there any, is there anything in Scripture alone that says to us, you know, you have a, a good feeling about Jesus in your heart, and you went forward at the altar call and, quote, got saved? That's all that matters, so the rest is up to you. You can write your own ticket as to what you're or maybe just watch this particular news channel or listen to this particular politician, and that'll be okay with God. I've noticed in the last year and a half a lot of the frenzy, a lot of the, oh my goodness, look what's happening, and we have to abide by these very, very arbitrary and, um, in many cases, irrational rules, is because so many people, for example, live in debt. So yes. if they have to meet their monthly bills, and they're concerned that if they take a stand for liberty and they take a stand for religious freedom, this might mean they'll lose their job, they won't be able to go to certain places. That chain really does, just like the Bible says, make the borrower a slave to the lender. And so we see this in terms of businesses closing. Why? They were concerned I could lose my business license. And I was talking to someone recently and the person said, they can't take my business license. And, you know, she was very adamant about it. And then I think it was even her husband who said, well, yeah, all they have to do is not renew it. And so we've, we've basically acquiesced to this idea that civil government has to give us permission to work. 
and we'll buy into the idea of getting something we want now, but not having to pay for it for a very long time. So when you violate God's law, the judgment ends up coming right alongside the violation. Yes, and that's a, another prime example. We tend to think of those sort of big ticket issues like murder and adultery and these, but the, the laws concerning finance, it's a total word. And this is why the Lord says that he is concerned for, and he is speaking his law concerning every aspect of life, including how we use our money, how we use our time and talents. And um, this, this is a, uh, a prime area, a prime example of, okay, you know, all right, I understand uh, the Ten Commandments say I'm not supposed to kill anybody, and I'm supposed to lie, but, you know, how I handle my money, that's my business. No, that's, it's either going to be the Lord's business or the devil's business. Those are the two choices, and you're going to be following one or the other. And this is another area where uh, maybe there's been some improvement in some churches over on this issue. You can, you can find some that are concerned to teach Christians how to get out of debt and how to maintain, you know, um, good money and that sort of thing. But I wonder how many understand the significance of just weights and measures and the importance of real money as opposed to fiat money. Exactly. Or how many people examine the way they make a living? There's some things, you know, you, you're a farmer, you grow food and, you know, that's an honest living or you're somebody who cuts people's hair. But what if you're someone who makes your income from entities, organizations, or governments that use your skill set to oppress and tyrannize others? Or do you just get to separate that out and say, what I do in my business life doesn't have an awful lot to do with what I do in my personal or my family life? You know, I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here, Andrea. I'm, I'm not going to use names, but and and you, I think you'll recognize this when I mention it, um, because you and I have talked about this. It goes to the heart of a struggle that I've dealt with personally, and it has to do with a certain type of, I'll say, mobile technology. I mean, there is a technology company whose products are fabulously popular and useful and immensely better than some of their competitors. But all the indications seem to be that they are engaged in the production of these things with the equivalent of slave labor in another country. And so the idea is, well, is there some other place I could, in not contributing to the misery of another human being, I can take my business elsewhere, so to speak. And the, th the fact is, yeah, you can, but guess what? It's not going to be as convenient. And so that comes down to that issue. Do, do I use something that as best as I can find out has not been uh, involved with evil and maybe be somewhat inconvenienced thereby? Or do I just say, nah, you know, it's, it's too hard to, to switch to that device or this thing or that. So I'm not going to worry about those uh, people who are being horribly impacted by this particular company's policies. I'm just going to continue to use them, the products. And I can see people saying, you know, well, I can't control everything. Um, how do I know other companies don't do the same thing? And I guess there's a valid point that if you spend all your time trying to figure out who the people are who are putting together the parts of your engine that you drive, um, after a while, you won't have time to do anything else. But I think a greater perspective needs to be what is the primary commandment when asked that Jesus responded and he quoted himself from the Old Testament that we're to love God with our whole mind, with our whole soul, with our strength. And in the process, as we make that commitment, we will then evaluate whether or not actions, thoughts, decisions, choices are in line with that. But I think a lot of people will give lip service to that as if like, oh, yeah, check, I do that, when in actual fact, every sin that we commit is a violation of that commandment. I remember many years ago before I went to seminary, I lived in another southern town where there was um, an employer, uh, uh, even at that time in the 19, late 70s and early 80s, 
an international corporate employer of a, I'll just say a tobacco product. And this company employed tons of people in that town. And it was quite a crisis of conscience for many of the fundamentalists who lived there because, you know, they didn't believe in using tobacco products of any kind, but they didn't have a problem getting a paycheck from this company. But it sent some of them into a, a horrible conflict of conscience when this same international company purchased a major vodka production company. So uh, working for a, a company that produced one type of thing that was considered sinful, they managed to make their peace with that. But it, when it went over to this side, oh my word, what am I going to do? Uh, should I quit my job? And I guess shallow teaching and shallow learning often leads people to knee-jerk reactions. So I'm not suggesting, and I don't think you are either, that if a person is positioned in civil government, that a person is positioned in the military uh, with a high-tech company or the businesses you were referring to, there are choices. And the choices are leave because I'm going to stay pure or affect change within. And the only reason I think, Charles, it seems so insurmountable is that Many of us has, have read the Bible as if it's a, just a personal devotion and have never really looked at it like, no, these are the marching orders. This is how the kingdom of God is realized by God's people, and eventually all people, bowing the knee to him and following his law word. The education system of the government is itself also a total word. It is a rival word to God's word, and it claims to, over uh, the period of the lifetime of, of an individual, and at least, say, for the uh, grades 1 through 12, it claims to educate individuals on how to live, how to think, whatever its project and program is. And so it arises in opposition to God's commands and God's word. It does so because the state is largely godless in our culture and our society and has been for a long time, or at least it's anti-biblical and anti-God's law. And let's say you, they, you, you have uh, a teacher in a government school who is wrestling with this. And I think it, 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 maybe it's, it's not uh, possible to completely lay out a blanket thing. For example, there may be some places, some pockets left in these United States where the government schools are essentially a neighborhood Christian type school. Many of us can remember, as I can, the public schools I went to when I was uh, in elementary school, we had devotional Bible reading, the Lord's Prayer over the PA system. But by law, they really weren't supposed to do that. And by law, they were eventually stopped all over the country. But okay, let's say you're a teacher in a government school and you are convinced that God's word is indeed a total word as it claims to be. What are you supposed to do? Can I affect change? Can I be a light in the darkness in that place? Or is it really going to be a compromise of my witness? Am I indicating to my students, whether they're first grade or 12th grade, that uh, no, God's word really doesn't apply here as I teach you mathematics or history or biology? Well, I think by God's grace, this is being pushed to the point where people really are having to make that decision whether they keep their children in the school or they continue to be employed by a system at its root, anti-God, anti-Bible, to the point that you're not allowed to really reference either one as authoritative. So I do think we're, we're at a point, and praise God for this, because it sometimes takes persecution for people to have a sense of, what am I doing? Where are we going? How did we get here? I think that those are the issues that people will only struggle with when they come to terms with the fact that God expects obedience and that if they're not obedient to all of his word, then and this is kind of a harsh statement. They shouldn't expect their prayers to be heard. Yes, and sort of the, um, if I can use this phraseology, the elephant in the room right now, keying off the, the topic of this Out of the Question podcast about should we expect doom, is the fact that we are dealing with circumstances right now in real time that raise that issue in a powerful way. And I think that the church especially is having to come to grips with this 
And for the people who already have an, a pessimistic, and in my estimation, and probably yours, a, a non-biblical eschatology on that point, uh, they think they see things being fulfilled, but maybe it's not exactly what they think. Maybe what we see being fulfilled before our eyes with all of the horrific nonsense that has poured out upon us in these recent months is exactly what you just said. People who are not being faithful to God's law, to God's word, and now they're dealing with the consequences. Even as I read that passage from the book of Jeremiah, these are conditional statements. If you do this, then this will happen. If you obey, there's blessing. If you disobey, there will be consequences. And so we are dealing with a doomsday scenario type thing right now in our culture. There's no denying that. But the real question is, is this the sign of the end or are the people with that mistaken eschatology missing the point that it's a sign of God's judgment being poured out on those who have disobeyed him, and he's calling us to repentance so that the blessing can come forth on his people? And see, that's such an important point, because just like any illness or any disease, if you don't have the right diagnosis, it's very hard to treat it properly. And we've seen that played out in the last year and a half. But the interesting thing is, and I've been examining in my own mind, does the Bible call us to be optimistic? And again, Noah Webster called optimism an all-for-the-best outlook. And interestingly enough, Charles, there is no definition for pessimism in Webster's 1828 dictionary. It doesn't exist there, which is kind of interesting. But a lot of people want to say the Bible calls us to be optimistic, and they go to Romans 8.28, that God will work all things together for the good for those who love him, who, for those who are the called according to his purpose. But it never says they'll have no trouble. It never says there won't be persecution. And one of the downsides of not knowing history, specifically biblical and church history, is that it's very easy for people to think, oh my goodness, this has never happened before. And so they feel that they have to go one of two ways, depression, slip my wrists, or expect an escape. And that's part of, as the expression goes, the chickens coming home to roost. In other words, bad teaching is going to lead to bad conclusions and so it's not that we should be optimistic or pessimistic, it's that we should be faithful and recognize that when we identify our sins, and we're not talking little ones, you know, the quote unquote white lie, when we uncover our sins and we confess them, God is faithful to forgive us. And so there won't be forgiveness, there won't be building back unless there's this acknowledgement, very specifically, how we have violated God's law. Yes, and I think that the broad answer to the question about whether we should have a gloomy or doom, doomsday type of outlook is if we are in covenant with God, if we are part of God's covenant family, then no, we should not, and that's certainly not God's perspective. I mean, the whole perspective of Scripture is that you have this fall from grace, but the unfolding history of all humanity and the world from that point onward is the Lord setting that to right. And the Lord saying, no, uh, doom shall not prevail here because I am sovereign. Our friend Martin Selbretti pointed out to me an essay by the late great Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield, and I'm a little fuzzy on the title, but it was something like Jesus' own self-understanding of his mission or something like that, in which Warfield points out in a, in a remarkably theonomic statement that, you know, part of the, the mission of Jesus is to, in fact, teach the world to obey God's law. And along with that, this is a different essay by Warfield, but I, I want to read just a couple of sentences of it, if I may, called Jesus Christ, the Propitiation for the Whole World. And listen to what he says here. He says, it's not merely a worldwide gospel with which John, the um, author of Revelation, knows himself entrusted. It's a worldwide salvation, which he's called to proclaim. For Jesus Christ is the Savior, not of a little flock merely, but of the world itself. And the end to which all things are working together is nothing other than a saved world. At the end of the day, 
there will stand out in the sight of all a whole world for the sins of which Christ's blood has been made effective expiation and for which he stands as advocate for the Father. Now, he says earlier in that essay, he's not talking about a universal salvation, universalism, but in the general sense, the outlook of the whole teaching of the scriptures, especially in the work of Christ, is that the world will be saved. Exactly. So it's, I think rather than use words optimistic or pessimistic or even doom and gloom, we should look in terms of being faithful to the proclamation of victory, the victory that happened at Calvary and the continuing victory. Now, if you don't know how to look at things, so if you're looking at things from 10 feet as opposed to 30,000 feet, as opposed to from the heavenlies, it's very possible to come to wrong conclusions. A great example is what the apostles and disciples must have felt the day after the crucifixion. They didn't understand. I'm sure the question why kept coming up over and over again. And depending on how they personally or as a group answered the question, but they missed what they were going to come to understand in a very, very real and dramatic way that would turn them from a bunch of scaredy cats to bold people who were willing to go to their earthly death to be faithful. And I have a friend who recently passed away, solid Christian woman, and over and over again, she would say things like, don't ask why, because God's not going to necessarily tell you why. The question we should be asking is what? Lord, what would you have me do right now? And depending on your circumstance, You're not going to necessarily be able to rectify our political situation or our international situation, but we can pray faithfully that we trust that no matter what befalls us, God is in control. And I think people will often give lip service to that idea without truly believing it. It reminds me of one of the seemingly endless stream of fads that blows through the evangelical churches from time to time, the uh, what would Jesus do bracelet and bumper sticker and all that stuff from some years ago. Somebody wisely pointed out, that's not the question. The question is, as you just referred to it, what would Jesus have me to do? It may be important to ask what Jesus would do, but Jesus you know, gave us a law. He gave us a standard of living for our time and for our place. You know, His mission was a little bit different than ours in that he was the divine son of God to you know, accomplish the salvation of his people. You know, we're on the other side of that accomplishment, and so what we are called to do may be a little bit different in our circumstance in some measure. But we referred to earlier about the different aspects of God's law that sometimes go unnoticed as an area where we are called to be just as faithful there as in some of the, as I referred to it, big ticket issues. And we referred to specifically the area of money and finance. And I'm just thinking about this passage from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, where the Lord says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be a food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says Yahweh of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I mean, that is a, that is a wonderful promise, but it's contingent upon bringing the tithe into the storehouse, recognizing God's sovereignty, the authority of his law word in that area as in all areas. And I love that passage because it gives such a great image. Here I am trying to outrun God's blessings, and I can't do it. Now, first of all, who in their right mind would want to outrun God's blessings? But the image is such a strong one that says, obey and I will bless. Now, it's not obey and then you send me a letter and tell me how you want me to bless you. It's obey and I will bring about all things for my glory and your good. And so we really need to establish in our minds over and over again that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And so we need to be 
part and parcel of building that which God wants us to build. And, and one of the focuses that I've had recently is for individual Christians and families to take a look at what they're investing in. In my area, I've gotten a small number of people to come together and pay for some child's Christian education. The same could be true if people can't afford effective medical care to be able to pool money together and help them. If we don't take back, which God says belongs to the family, belongs to the church, then all we can do is complain. But if we take those steps and use our tithe and use offerings to do these things, then it doesn't matter if you got your running shoes on, you're not going to outrun God's blessing. Somebody once said that if you, uh, if you want to see where your priorities are, take a look at your checkbook. I don't know how many people use checkbooks anymore or look at your online bank statement. Uh, you'll see where your, your money is going and your, your substance. And I'll just be bold enough to suggest to any of our listeners who may find themselves in this situation, if you've got a little extra income in this uh, day and time, well, rather than sign up for the next tier of Netflix, why don't you give a little extra money to the Chalcedon Foundation? You know, tie a little more money to your local Bible-believing church. Uh, this would be an indication of seeking the fulfillment of Malachi 3.10. He, again, following that misreading in, in, intentionally, um, if you'll upgrade to the next level of your favorite social media, then I'll pour out a blessing. That's not what he says. <laughs> you know, right. um, it, It's contributing to uh, the Lord's work that is, um, is what brings the blessing. And then in terms of our original question about doom, I think too many people are listening to blind guides. Doesn't mean that they're not nice people. And it might not even mean that politically or, you know, societally, you think the same way. But I find myself, no matter who the commentator is, conservative, non-conservative, whatever, if they are not starting with the Lord Jesus Christ and the need for people to be obedient then they fall into the category of blind guides. It doesn't mean that they won't occasionally get it right. It's just that where are we going for our marching orders? So knowing what's happening right now across the world with the seizure of American military arsenal, et cetera, I know I personally can bring my petition to the Lord, but in answer to the question, Lord, what would you have me do? It isn't to dwell on how bad it is or the bad guy in the White House or how many terrible people occupy the halls of Congress. If we put our focus on that, uh, we won't have to worry about outrunning God's blessings because we're not following the prescription. The prescription is do what I say. Your tithe, all your tithes, including your regular uh, Levitical tithe, your rejoicing tithe, your poor tithe. If I'm saying things and you don't even know what I'm talking about, then that's part of the problem. And I'd highly recommend that you find out what that's, what those things are. It's no coincidence that the source of much of the doomsaying and the uh, pessimistic outlook on things in life comes from the media. Uh, movies, entertainment, television, it's hard to find anything that is from a, even a remotely biblical sense uplifting. Uh, th there is such a negative edge to everything that comes out of Hollywood these days. And it's really been that way for a long time because at base, the people who produce films, who write the scripts for TV programs, they themselves are at war with God. And so doom is, is sort of built into their consciousness. They may not think of it that way, but is it a surprise to anyone that the people who uh, are involved in all this, their personal lives are a total train wreck by just about any standard. People whose lives are, are not committed to the Lord, you know, it, it is a, a negative outlook on, on just about everything. But if you go back, and since I'm talking about the area of media and entertainment, if you go back far enough in the history of that, when the people 
who were largely in control of those things, they had a more different outlook. And you can find early films and even TV programs that were more encouraging and uplifting. People make fun of them nowadays, but the fact is there was a different orientation. Uh, there was a little bit more of a, of a biblical emphasis in society at that time than there is now. The Bible tells us you have to guard your heart. You also have to guard your eyes, and you also have to guard your ears, and you also have to determine who you're going to spend your time learning from. And uh, a sad testimony to today is how few people actually want to read, and because they've gotten out of the habit, they've clicked their way through knowledge or just watch 20 seconds or a couple of minutes of a video uh, that they're very limited in even how to understand our times. So it sounds like a cliche, turn off the media, turn off the television, go to your bookshelf and find something that you obviously thought might have been a good idea to read at one point because it's sitting there and start interacting with ideas and then relating them back to scripture. So not just reading books that agree with the Bible in every case, reading a book and then seeing how, you see, their viewpoint is not biblical, therefore their conclusions are not. And, and that's something that most anybody can do by allocating their time in terms of what does God want me to be with, doing with my time today? Not 10 years from now, not a five-year plan, maybe a five-minute plan or a five-hour plan to effectively do something that serves and builds the kingdom. And certainly the, uh, the prime example, the paradigm case of someone who took that seriously was the founder of the Chalcedon Foundation, R.J. Rushdoony. Um, it, you don't have to read too much of the man's work to realize that he was immensely well-read. And I don't know, what is it, like uh, 8,000 volumes, 10,000 volumes in his personal library? And I've often thought, I don't know if the Rushdoony household when he was growing up ever had a TV set, but thank goodness if it did, then it never was turned on because, I mean, the man was constantly reading and not only simply reading, but also remembering and making notes. And I think this is one reason perhaps why he is resented by lesser men is the fact that, you know, he, he didn't get degrees from Harvard or Yale, and yet he knew more than many of these uh, tenured professors uh, ever would know in a lifetime because he took reading so seriously and didn't waste his time with frivolous entertainment. Right. And to keep in mind that if we're going to produce people like him for future generations, because he would have been the first to tell you he was not the final word on matters of society and politics and medicine and all that, he expected that people would continue the work. I think now's a good time for people to get serious, serious with themselves, no matter how old they are, serious with their children and their grandchildren, instilling this idea that what you do now will have consequences for the future. So use your time wisely, use your decision making wisely, and realize that it isn't about you, but it's about him him being Jesus Christ. Yes, and if we can leave our listeners with uh, a word of encouragement and hope, uh, I've quoted this before, that the future is as bright as the promises of God. Amen to that. Well, thank you, folks, for joining us again. As always, we'd love to hear from you, and you can reach us via email at outofthequestionpodcast at gmail. Dot com. Charles, talk to you next time. Thank you, Andrea. Take care. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.